Audi, CA9781, black Audi, CA9781, you are blocked in quite a few cars. Can you please remove your vehicle quickly? Uh, may I humbly request the men to kindly come towards the middle. I would like the ladies to come down at the back there. If the men can come in. Gentlemen, can you come this side, please? That's open for the ladies there. Yeah, even the people on this side, if they can come closer. The gentleman on that side, where Imam Yasin is sitting, can they come more in, please?
Radhe Shafiq. Can we kindly be seated, please? Dr. Rashid Omar, next to Sheikh Murad, please. Make sure that everyone gets a copy of the CAPA code, please. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ba'd. Distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, it gives me immense pleasure to extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you to this very positive initiative to embrace the Cape Accord in order to stem the tidal wave of hate speech and incitement of violence. And today you will hear the introduction to the Cape Accord by some of our very eloquent speakers seated in front here. However, in order to start and commence our program, I would like to call upon the Honorable Sheikh Saadullah Khan to do the opening dua invoking the divine rahma and help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sheikh Saadullah Khan. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi rahman rahim Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen. Sayyidina wa nabiyina wa maulana Muhammad wa ala alihi al-tahirin wa sahbihi ajma'in. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, all praise is due to our creator, cherisher, nourisher, and sustainer of the universe. Salutations upon the best of messengers and all the messengers, upon Prophet Muhammad as the final messenger, and upon his family and his companions. Allahumma tahir qulubana wa afkarana wa aqwalana wa a'malana min al riyai wal fasadi wa nifaqi wa shiqaqi wa su'i l'akhlaq. O oh Allah, cleanse our hearts, our thoughts, our words, and our deeds from doing things for the sake of show, from corruption, from hypocrisy, from division, and from the characteristics of negativity. Allahumma wahid sufuf al mu'minin wa alif bayna qulubina wa aslih dhat baynina wa hdina subul al salam. O oh Allah, unite the ranks of the faithful. Cast mutual love in our hearts, reconcile for us matters of discord, and guide us to the pathways of peace. Ya Ilahi, bi sabab hurmat al awamir fi al furqan, ijalna hujjat al litqan wal ihsan bil ikhlas wal iman. O Allah, 
by the sanctities of your command in the criterion, the Quran, make us to be of those who are a testament for excellence and for goodness, and make us to be of those who are sincere and faithful. Allahumma yahmina jami'an min takhmin lil muta'amireen wa min al-barri dhati lil muta'tarrifeen. O oh Allah, protect all of us from the scheming of the conspirators and from the self-righteousness of the extremists. Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min qati'ati al-aqriba wa min jafwati al-ahibba wa min khiyanati al-azdiqa wa min shamamati al-a'da. O oh Allah, we seek your protection and from estrangement of our family and relations. We seek your protection from the coldness of loved ones, from the betrayal of friends, and from the rejoicing and gloating of our enemies and our detractors. Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbu al-afwa fa'afu anna. Oh Allah, you are the one who loves to pardon. Please forgive us. فنسأل الله أن يجعلنا من المتقين وجعلنا من الصالحين وجعلنا من عبادك المخلصين. Oh Allah, we ask you to make us among the God conscious, among the righteous, and among the sincere ones. اللهم افتح لنا بالخير واختم لنا بالخير وجعل عواقب أمورنا بالخير بيدك الخير والعافية إنك على كل شيء قدير. Oh Allah, let everything begin well. Let everything end well. And let the consequence of what we do be good. For all goodness, O oh Allah, is in your control and you have power over everything. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-Nabi Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim fil alameen innaka hamidun majid دعواهم فيها سبحانك اللهم وتحيتهم فيها سلام وآخر دعواهم أن الحمد لله رب العالمين آمين يا رب العالمين May Allah accept جزاك الله خير شيخ سعد الله for the beautiful dua I just want to say to the ladies upstairs if you want to come down there's place for the ladies downstairs for those who want to come down on the left hand side of the masjid Alhamdulillah, we of Masjid Al-Quds are extremely honored to host this positive initiative here today in order to introduce and embrace the Cape Accord. Masjid Al-Quds is only but one of the many masajid, organizations, ulama, and individuals who have already embraced this Cape Accord. And inshallah, we hope from here that it will grow from strength to strength, not only in the Western Cape, but throughout South Africa, Southern Africa, and globally as well. Ameen, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Without further ado, I call upon the chairperson of the Board of Trust of Masjid Al-Quds, and also currently the convener of the Cape Accord, Haji Sattar Parker, to convene and to facilitate this meeting, Ajay Sattar Park. Awuz billahi min ash-shaitan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ashabihi wa barik wa sallim. Amma ba'd, respected members of the ulama, respected elders, members of the jamaat, those listening via the airwaves of Radio 76, as well as a sister radio station in Pretoria, those on the digital platform, Facebook, YouTube, as well as the app of this masjid. I greet you, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And if you happen to be outside the house of Islam, wherever you may be, may the peace and blessings be bestowed upon each and every one. There's a beautiful saying in the English language, a journey of a thousand miles begins but with a single step. Today we do not have a single step, we have many, many steps here today. And inshallah, Allah willing, may this be one of those very momentous occasions in the history of the Muslim community, not only in Cape Town, but nationally, inshallah, as well as internationally. Just to give you a very brief overview of the program today, I will be imposing upon someone within the next minute or two 
just to give us a two-minute overview of what the Cape Accord is all about from the time that it was uh, visualized until the stage that we have reached here today. Thereafter, there will be three keynote speakers, each speaking for 10 minutes, inshallah, followed by four respondents who will be responding with a time frame of five minutes each. Without any further ado, I'd like to call upon, and as I said, I'm going to be imposing on him, Hafiz Mahmoud Khatib, like you did a little earlier on when we had our AGM, within the space of two minutes, and I'm one of the few people that normally put a stopwatch in front of him so that the two minutes are two minutes. Hafiz Ab, if you don't mind, thank you so much. أيها الحبة في السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. الحمد لله. Indeed, a momentous occasion because for four, over 300 years, Allah سبحانه وتعالى has blessed us with a beautiful community and society of Muslims in the most southern tip of Africa, where we have been able to enjoy the liberty and the beauty of enjoying our Deen of Al Islam in the most beautiful manner. We've come through difficult times of slavery, colonialism, as well as uh, the difficulties of apartheid. But now we are faced with some of the challenges of freedom. So despite coming from a beautiful context of I'm right with the possibility of being wrong, or you are wrong with the possibility of being right, we find today with our newfound freedom that many new concepts and ideas are coming into our beautiful land. Amongst them, when we disagree we disagreed about concepts in the past, we would have intensive debate, and we would, to the point of uh, vehemently putting our points forward. But uh, alas, we have come to a situation now where um, uh, Islam and the very um, uh, abilities and the possibilities of us coexisting and declaring each other out of the fold of Islam, the strange phenomenon has been imported into our country. It was something that we could have dealt with in the past also in a uh, respectable uh, manner. But uh, this foreign phenomenon that has come in whereby I declare or I give judgment on the state of your Iman, and this allows me to spill your blood, this has impacted on our community from a geopolitical point of view. And now declaring uh, or discussing these type of concepts has taken other dimensions as we have experienced in the recent past. So the Cape Accord is a direct consequence of this uh, condition and situation that we are living in. And last year, after the successful program of Ummah in this array, a uh, few uh, independent organizations came together uh, to try and see how we can reclaim uh, the wasatiya and mainstream Islam from the fringes of, uh, of those uh, extreme and um, uh, non-violent extremists and violent extremists to reclaim the mainstream wasatiya Islam so that we can leave a legacy behind for our children and Islam that uh, does away with hate speech, with discord, with declaring any person out of the fall of Islam and Islam where we cohesively exist uh, on the basis of ukhuwa, of brotherhood and sisterhood where uh, the sanctity of la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is always maintained. So alhamdulillah, these organizations have come together inshallah and we'll be listening a bit more about that in order to uh, guide and leave a legacy for our community going forward. Shukran zazeelan wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shukran. For the record, those founding organizations are Islamia College, International Peace, Peace College of South Africa, IPSA, Jamiatul Qurra, Medina Institute, Masjid Al Quds Institute, Claremont Main Road Masjid, Al Ghazali College, Al Ansar Foundation in Durban, Zinatul Islam Masjid in New Street, and the Abu Bakr Siddiqui Masjid in Pretoria. In addition to that, the founding uh, members are Sheikh Ihsan Talib, Hafiz Abu Bakr Muhammad, Sheikh Sadul Khan, Hafiz Mahmoud Khatib, Sheikh Muhammad Murad, Sheikh, Sheikh Fakhruddin Uwaisi, Sheikh Rashid Umar, Doc, Sheikh Dr. Rashid Umar, Sir Ibrahim Baudin, Abdul Razak Razak, Sitar Parker, Taj Akleka, Mikhail Kolya, Nazir Osman, Sharif Abbas, Ismail Kala, Shahid Khamildin, 
is met Bully, Nazmi Skrude, Ambassador Ibrahim Rasul, Nabawiya Malik, Dr. Fatima Hendricks, Mohammed Luande, Sheikh Abdurrahman Alexander, Tandile Kona, Farid Sayyid, and Shafiq Morton. That's for the record. Jamaat, I would now like to call upon our first speaker for today. Some time ago, an acting judge at the High Court in KwaZulu-Natal, one of the leading thinkers in our country, a person that likes to prick the conscience when he delivers beautiful talks, an advocate, but above all that, a Hafiz of the Holy Quran. It gives me immense pleasure to call upon Hafiz Abu Bakr Muhammad to address us for the next 10 minutes, inshallah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Was salatu was salamu ala ashrafil mursaleen Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen I would like to begin by quoting a hadith of our Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam This is a hadith Qudsi and this is what he says. When Allah Almighty wishes to punish a people, he does not remove knowledge from the hearts of the people. Rather, he removes knowledgeable people from the people so that people in their ignorance elect ignorant leaders who in turn mislead themselves and misguide others. This is a situation not only for Muslims, but it is a human behavior of all people around the world. <clears throat> the United States, Britain, France, and all these countries are illustration of the kind of leadership that they set up. So it's not exclusive, but it is for us to remind ourselves that we get what we deserve. If we abandon knowledge, transformational knowledge, if we abandon understanding of the Qur'an, just read parrot fashion, then we in turn will invoke this punishment from Allah Almighty. You all know Surah Fatiha. There's not a single one here that does not know it by heart. And you start by saying, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Lord of the worlds, galaxies, universes, no amount of grain or sand in all the deserts and all the beaches of the world will match up or count the number of planets and galaxies and universes that Allah Almighty has created. And when we meander through the Quran, its oceans and mountains and rivers, we end up in the last surah, which is Surah An-Nas. 114 chapter of the Holy Quran. And why did Allah Almighty place that in the last? Because that is the university of life. That after going through all this multiplicity of his creation, we end up seeking refuge in him. A'udhu bi rabbin nas, malikin nas, the king of mankind. Ilahin nas, the God of mankind. It resonates with Maliki Yomiti. Iya kana abudu wa iya kana stain. Thee alone do we worship and thee alone do we ask for help. Bin Sharil Waswasil Khannas. From the evil of the Khannas, the slimy person, not an individual. When Nabi Muhammad والسلام, was asked, he said, Shaitan is in both jinn and insan. But insan will have more shaitan than jinn. And what is this wiswas? There are ten streams. Amongst them is greed. Amongst them is kibr. It's pride. It's arrogance. It's contempt. These are all the, the wis waswas in the individual that we're seeking protection. And Allah Almighty reminds us that unless and until we don't 
purify our hearts and our relationship. Minal jinnati wan nas, we seeking protection from jinn and insan. Suratun nas is protection from yourself. Suratul falak is protection from the injury that is done to you from someone else. But Suratun nas is a protection from your own selves, which is evil thoughts. And what are those? Allah says, bani Adam. I have honored the children of Adam. Allah has created the children of Adam, or Adam alayhi salam, and all human beings in the best of modes. Our relationship is born out of this. Do we need a scholar to tell you this? The maqasid of the sharia, one of the maqasid is haqqul karama, sanctity of human dignity. Every human being, Muslim or non-Muslim, Buddhist, Jew, Christian, every human being born of his mother's womb is born with inherent dignity. And inherent in dignity is the freedom of expression and of course opinion and of course to disagree with that opinion. But in a manner that is consonant with the respect of that person. How much education do you really need to understand this basic and this is why Muslims, if we want to invoke Allah's curse and we abandon transformational knowledge of the Quran, this is now going to come upon this. Bala will come on this community as sure as the sun will rise tomorrow. Last year, on the same platform, in the presentation in Ramadan, when we talked about the Ummah in this array, I had mentioned about this. This is how dangerous this would be if Muslims do not address this problem that is born out of envy and hasad, that refuses to acknowledge another person's point of view, that then evolves into intolerance, and then from intolerance evolves into extremism, a kind of disease that becomes non-stop, like cancer. And I have a particular Quote, because the, the verses of the Quran, there are several of them enumerated lead to this. Envy, that is hasad, leads to puffed up pride. Istigbar, leading to derision, contempt for somebody. Of a counter argument, arising from denial of one's own emotional state and ingratitude to one's own blessings resulting from wantonness of spiritual capacity, which in turn is demonstrated in ignorant impudence, expressing itself in zealotry, hamiya, and resulting in vain glorious fakhr, leading to rudeness and cruelty. What was that result? It happened a few weeks, a week or two ago, in Durban, in the mosque in Ottawa, three people walked in, attacked the Musallis there, one died, innocent human being. And do you know, brothers and sisters, and this is the information that I can share with you, is that this bomb that was found there wasn't actually a bomb to explode. It was a chemical device or chemical substance, white chemical substance, to which was attached a cell phone. And the forensics have already demonstrated that with electrical charge, it would catch on fire. It had a strap. And the theory that is being worked upon is that it was intended to strap it around the imam. And in the course of the assault, make him run out into the streets so everybody can see and with the cell phone switch and this person will be set onto fire with both his arms spread this way. I ask you brothers, 
is this the Islam that you want for your children? You make up your mind. I have made mine already. To deal with such instances with every legal power in our command. If we do not do anything about this, this is why the importance of this meeting is precisely that, that extremism is shaitani. It is against the maqasid of the sharia. It has destroyed many communities around the world. And it will destroy our community in South Africa and put to waste the legacy of 300 years. So take it very seriously. The Cape Accord has arisen even before this incident last year. But the accord is to confirm and endorse the Amman message. The Amman message is in, in, in Jordan, which other speakers will illustrate more, and I'm going to curtail my talk now, is where all scholars from around the world have come to define one point. When is, who is a Muslim? And they have identified that all the madhabs from the Sunni world and the Shia world, all those within those two madhabs part of, are part of Islam. And that is the endorsement that we Muslims of South Africa that constitute a microcosm of the macrocosm. We have jamaats and societies of different languages and cultures, weddings and functions, some of different cultures and some slightly different, but we've been living together. So we should then go back to the roots of respect and tolerance, obey the commands of Allah Almighty, and when we say, Qul, أعوذ برب الناس ملك الناس إله الناس mean it don't give lip service to it mean it and Allah will open doors for you because once you observe the real purpose of Surah Al-Nas Surah Al-Fatiha opens up and there will be openings out of openings for you, for your community, for your family for their children, for the whole society. Let's do it. Muslims, you have no other option. Allah is giving you a test, as sure as the sun will rise tomorrow. And if any one of us want to shirk this responsibility, we will pay for this. Inna nahnu nuhyi al-mawta wa naktubu ma qaddamu wa atharahum. Allah Almighty says, I give life to the dead and I take into account what you send ahead and I take into account what you leave, the footprints you leave behind. Let us leave a beautiful footprints for our children. I'm appealing to you as a grandfather. As I, all of you are sitting here, work and put our hands together, extend our hearts so that we can, in this month of Ramadan, we can say we have really observed our responsibility and this is our footprint, a very solid, united community for justice, for fairness, for respect and for human dignity. Remember, brothers, it is a creational law of the Almighty that we get what we deserve, not what we desire. The good that you do benefits you, the harm that you do injures you. From this, there is no escape. May Allah Almighty accept your fast and your salah, and may he make this occasion, not only that it is historic, but make it a successful one, and may I, as a person from Durban, extend my congratulations to you, the Muslim community of Cape Town, that you, like before, are setting the road for reconstruction and the unity of the Muslim community. Shukran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thought-provoking and shocking.
That is the way I would like to summarize that absolutely beautiful talk by Hafiz Abu Bakr Muhammad. Jamaat, please join me. I don't know how Hafiz Ab manages. He was on TV last night. He was at the Claymont Main Road Masjid this afternoon, this morning, and he's with us today. And Alhamdulillah, please make a, 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 a very, very passionate dua. Tomorrow, inshallah, he will be leaving for Umrah. We make dua that Allah Park must take him salamat, bring him back salamat, and grant him Umrah, Makbul, and Mabrur, inshallah. The following other organizations have also endorsed the Cape Accord. It's just come to me now. It's virtually breaking news. I would just like to read those names very, very quickly. Um, Academia Library in Lansdowne, the Oval Socio-Economic Research Institute, OCA of South Africa, Cape Town Islamic Education Center, CTIEC, the Habibia Sufi Masjid, our beloved Habibia Masjid down the road, Islamic Dawah Center, the Jama Masjid, Grey Street in Durban, one of the largest mosques in our country, Masjid Al-Nur La Mercy in Durban, Queensbridge Masjid in Durban, Van Gate Medina Musalla, Centurion Medina Musalla, Forest Hill Medina Musalla, Minland Medina Musalla, Media Review Network, Muslim Youth Movement, Min Hajul Quran International, Positive Muslims, and South African Muslim Network, known as SAMNET, SANZAF, as well as the World Association of Al Azhar Graduates. Alhamdulillah. Our next speaker to give us a perspective from a youth point of view hails all the way from the Eastern Cape, made a special point of being here today. At half past four, he's on the flight back again to his uh, beloved hometown. Jamaat, I call upon my friend Tandile Kona to address us for the next 10 minutes, please. Tandile. He's also the president of a very important organization in our country, the Muslim Youth Movement. Audhu billah min ash-shaytan wa jum bismillahi wa rahman wa rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, respected brothers and sisters, I'm not going to be long. I'm not sure. It's, in this course, we have a saying that says, Isususama uh, sitana rakulu, literally meaning my stomach is not too long, which means I don't eat much. So I'm not going to take long as well in speaking. Um, dear brothers and sisters, the history of Islam in this country and in the world shows us that when we are united, the world benefits for, from us. When Muslims are united, the world benefits, but we also grow as an ummah. The great civilizations that Muslims have built over the years have been built on the back of unity. And it is that unity that has been the backbone of Muslims throughout the centuries. The state of disarray that we find ourselves in today has made those whose mission it is to, 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 to divide and defeat Muslims much, much easier. They've been able through their own means, but also assisted, assisted by, our, by, by our own disunity to infiltrate our ranks and to be able to tell us who are, who, to be able to, to define our enemies for us. We have become proxies in wars that, have not, that are not of, of our own making around the world. We have bought into this axis of evil, a senseless analogy, which uh, emanates from uh, the former president of the U.S. Uh, when he termed three nations as, as the axis of evil. We've bought into that and we've begun to identify ourselves with the narratives emanating from Washington, emanating from London, from, Bar from Brussels, and from everywhere else other than from within our own community. Our divisions are not based on our loyalty to Allah, but our divisions are based on our loyalty to our benefactors be they from the Middle East, be they from the West, or be they from the East. We are more loyal to our benefactors than we are to the message of Islam, and we are to Allah. It is an unfortunate situation, but it is a situation which we put ourselves in, and we only have ourselves to, get, to, to, to be able to, to get out of. We have held on too tightly to labels 
as Sunni Muslim, as Shia Muslim, as Diobandi, as, as this and that, but we have forgotten the most important label that we need to hold on to, that of being a human being, and being a human being is being Muslim. We have let go of that label, we have held on much, much tight, tightly to other labels. Yes, we have our differences in interpretation of scripture, in skin color, in origin, in nationality, and in everything else. And that is something to be celebrated, brothers and sisters, not something to be, to be fought over, not something that should be a cause of conflict. Our differences should be something to be celebrated, should be something that we should hold, hold dearly to, but also open ourselves up to others as well. Coming back to our country, it is unfortunate that we seem to have imported these ideas and these conflicts and made them our own. Now, with our history of apartheid and colonialism, we should have known better, we should have been better prepared for things that, uh, such as this, uh, the, 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 the sad event that happened in Ottawa, in, in Deben, at the Imam Hussein Mosque. We should have been better prepared for this eventuality because we have been warned before. This is not something new, it's something that has been spoken about, that it threatens to divide us further, it threatens to cause instability within our communities, it threatens to weaken us as a community in South Africa. As the MYM, an organization that has always been working in the, in the communities in and around South Africa, we saw the signs of the brewing storm. We've been talking about this to young people. A few weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, there were pictures that were spread out on Facebook of young people from the township of, of Bochabelo in, in, in the Free State displaying proudly a flag of ISIS, celebrating their membership of, of ISIS publicly. Some of us in the MYM contacted them because we know some of them, and we asked them if they knew the implications of what they were doing, and they knew that what the flag meant. And in their view, the flag was the flag of Islam. And we asked them, is that a flag of Islam or is it a flag of ISIS? We told them, unfortunately, they refused to take down the pictures, but we told them about the implications of what they are doing for themselves, but also for the community of Muslims as well in South Africa. So we did not hesitate to endorse the, the Cape Accord because it is something that we have always believed in. But we want to warn that left unaddressed, the sectarianism that's infecting our community will not only tear us apart, but will also open the floodgates for groups like ISIS that are in their retreat in the Middle East. They are bound to, to, to look for homes elsewhere. And if we don't stop this sectarianism, they are going to find fertile ground here in this country for them to blossom again. So brothers and sisters, it is a call from the MOM that we embrace the Cape Accord, but we not only embrace, we embrace it, but we also spread the word around it to our families, in our businesses, in our workplaces, in our masajids, in our madaris. Because the problem that we have is that we have left, we have a, a, a vacuum. We have a vacuum in both the body and in the minds. Now that vacuum is being exploited by people who come bearing gifts to fill the bodily vacuum in, in, in the form of food parcels and other things. And with those gifts come the ideology that has informed the sectarianism that we see. But also, they come bearing gifts to fill another vacuum, a vacuum in the mind that we have left uh, unattended. So, it is about time that we take a stand as a community and fill those two very important vacuums. The reason that ideas like those of ISIS and other sectarian ideas flourish in our townships, I'm talking about townships because I come from the township, is because of the disparities that unfortunately also afflict the Muslim communities. The levels of undignified poverty that you see in townships makes it easy for anyone who has 50 rand to give away 
to convince people to join him in whatever nefarious activities uh, that he wants to embark on. It is not that people in the, in the townships are unthinking, but it is that like people anywhere else, they've tend to look inwards. They've tend to look out for themselves. They've tend to focus on their own survival rather than the survival of the entire uh, ummah. So brothers and sisters, I just want to remind us that we should use this Ramadan and remember it in the Ramadans that follow, that this is the Ramadan that we said, not in our name. This is the Ramadan that we said this far and no further. Things such as those that happened in Ottawa and in many other places around the world will not happen in this country, will not allow them to happen. Allah in his glorious Quran says, in chapter, in chapter Al-Imran, uh, uh, verse 103 says, and hold fast all of you together to the rope of Allah, and do not be separated, and remember, Allah, remember Allah's favor unto you, how you were enemies and he made friendship between your hearts so that you became as brothers by his grace, and how you were upon the brink of the abyss of, of the fire and he did save you from it. Thus Allah makes clear his revelations unto you so that you may be guided. Lastly, brothers and sisters, once again, the MOM wishes to commit itself to the values as espoused by the Cape Accord. And we wish to congratulate the people of Cape Town for taking the lead in this very noble initiative. May Allah bless our effort and may, may he open our hearts to the message of the Cape Accord of tolerance and of coexistence. And may Allah accept this noble initiative from his lonely, lowly uh, servants. Thank you for your attention. Shukran Shazila. Shukran Tanjale. Allahu Akbar. I think the beautiful message there from Brother Tandile is not in my name. Let this Ramadan be a Ramadan, not in my name. And he's also reminded us about another very, very beautiful saying that the battle of the 20th century will not be fought with guns and bullets, but will be fought to win the minds of people. And he's reminded us that we must unshackle the brain chaining that takes place today. Our next speaker, Jamaat and listeners and viewers, is a gentleman that has been playing a pivotal role in the World for All movement, which, is glo which has gone global. A former ambassador from our beloved country to Washington and a prime mover in trying to bring human beings together, gives me great pleasure to call upon Ambassador Ibrahim Rasul to address us. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم Respected ulama, our beloved leaders of our community جماعت المسلمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته قال الله تعالى في القرآن الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله سبحانه وتعالى says in the holy Quran in a really beloved surah الرحمن the most merciful علم القرآن who has taught us the Quran خلق الإنسان who has created human beings علمه البيان with the capacity for intelligent speech if you forget anything else about the Cape Accord, it is that the Cape Accord calls you back to the ways of intelligent speech. Intelligent speech that we have been created with is the medium through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to communicate. Denouncing each other is not intelligent speech. Labeling each other is not intelligent speech. Mocking each other is not intelligent speech. Distorting what each other stands for is not intelligent speech. And that is what the Cape Accord stands for. If you read the document, you will see that the Cape Accord, in fact, starts with the acknowledgement that we Muslims collectively are the victims of a discrimination of Islamophobia. How is it? 
that today the victims of a discrimination and a prejudice and Islamophobia wants to become the perpetrators of discrimination and prejudice against others within our own ranks. That is the challenge of the Cape Accord to all of us. It recognizes that we live in a world of diverse faiths and diverse cultures and languages and colors and ethnicities and creeds and races, etc., etc., and then calls on us that we, 1,6 billion, cannot eliminate 7 billion others, but that we can learn to coexist with them. But we cannot say to others outside of Islam that we want to coexist with you when we show no capacity for coexisting with those who pray like us, fast like us, go to Makkah like us, and so forth, when we are intolerant to those who look like us. And yet we can promise so easily that we will coexist with others who don't pray like us, don't look like us, don't eat like us, don't fast like us. And so... The Cape Accord comes and effectively reminds us of the verse in the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says how those early Muslims were expelled from Makkah, were expelled from their homes for no other reason except that they said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our Lord. That's why they were expelled did not say that they said Allah is our Lord and he doesn't visit graves. Did not say that Allah is our Lord and you don't stand in salawat. Did not say Allah is our Lord and you may like Ali more than you like Abu Bakr. May Allah be pleased with him. It says those who say Allah is our Lord. And Allah says, had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not checked one people against another, used one group of people against another group of people, you would have seen the destruction of monasteries, of churches, of synagogues, of temples, and of masajid, everywhere where the name of Allah is celebrated abundantly. It did not even go into a distinction between a Sunni masjid and a Shia masjid. It starts with monasteries and temples and synagogues that all of those cannot stand any destruction because if only once the name of Allah is celebrated in there, it is a holy place. So the Cape Accord is saying to us, if we do not stand up and stop this, we do not do the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want to say to you, we have seen this movie in history. All of us celebrate the great civilization, for example, in Andalusia, where its golden age produced religious tolerance that the Amir even had Jewish public servant, directors, general, etc., etc. Where we saw scientific flourish, we gifted the world algorithms through al-Khawarizmi. Where we saw cultural expansion in dress and in cuisine. Where we saw knowledge unbound and people could think of whatever they wanted and produce poetry and literature of the finest kinds that the world had ever seen. And where the architecture was simply sublime and the world couldn't understand how could these Muslims invent the horseshoe arch that carries more than its own weight. And that was almost the case for four centuries until a group came along that we know as the al muwahidun or history called the al muhads The al muwahidun styled themselves as the people who came to purify Tawheed. They came to decide who was Muslim and who was not Muslim. And so they came, and they came there with, for example, the Zahiri Madhab and started destroying other Madhabs, like, for example, the Maliki Madhab, 
Not only did they ban their books and their kitabs, they burnt their books and their kitabs and reserved for themselves the rights to decide who were Muslims and who were not. And then they turned against the Christians and the Jews of Andalusia, making the Jews either convert or die. And Christians had to wear particular dress so that they could always be identified and mocked. And what they did, they united a diverse and divided and different Christian world and they all came together and they said, we must get rid of these Muslims. And at the battle of Las Navas de Tolosa or Al-Uqab in Arabic, on the 16th of July, 2012, they defeated the al muwahidun armies. And within 40 years, the Muslims lost Cordoba and Sevilla. And 1492, we were expelled along with the Jews from Andalusia. The question is, were we murdered or did we commit suicide? That's the fundamental question. There may have been a foreign knife in us in 1492, but the suicide started with those who called themselves the custodians of Tawheed. And that was the age of conviviality. And from that moment, we have always been the perpetual other. And that memory of the al muwahidun lies in the head of every non-Muslim civilization ever since that Islam is a threat. And that's the fundamental question that we come today to say, we jealously guard the definition of who is Muslim, and we refer it to Allah and the Quran and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and we jealously deny anyone the right to be the arbiter of who is Muslim or who is not. I go so far as to say that if anyone abrogates for themselves this right, and I put it in a question form so that I don't get misquoted, are they maybe not guilty of associating partnership with Allah and setting themselves up as co-governors of Allah by abrogating for themselves a right that should only be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I exhort you to be very, very careful. And they use a variety of tools of discord. They conflate faith and politics. They have political aims in the Middle East but they appeal to us to hate Shias. They conflate the trouble of Arabs as if it is the trouble of all the Ummah. Their rhetoric is profound that the Haramain is in danger, that Islam is being taken over and we must not fall for that. And they are utilizing the language of intellectual and theological terror on us. When they don't understand or like something, it's either kufr, bid'ah, or shirk. And we must be very careful with those words. And so, I want to say to you, my dear brothers and sisters, that what we stand for, is the opposite of what they stand for because we, particularly we who have read Surah al Khujurat, the inner apartments. Very ironic that this chapter of the Quran is revealed in the ninth year of Hijrah, also called the year of deputations. This was the year that Islam was becoming known in the world. This was the year in which Islam was beginning to expand. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Allah's wisdom understood that we were going to get different people who became Muslim and different cultures were going to be curious about who we are. And so deputation after deputation came. This was the year in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to us, Ya ayyuhal nasu inna khalaqanakum min dhakari wa untha wa ja'alnakum shu'uba wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to us that I have made you from a single source, but I've created you with differences, different tribes, different nations, different languages, so that you may come to know one another, not hate one another, not kill one another, not despise one another. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not only give us an instruction of how that we should manage difference. Allah gives us the tools to manage difference. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, says, 
If someone comes to you and tells you something, fatabayanu, ascertain the truth. Spook stories, but you know, fatabayanu. Suspicions that you hear, fatabayanu, ascertain the truth. There is no excuse for acting ignorantly or in emotion. If there is a dispute between one group and another group, Fa'aslahu, reconcile. Not who runs to a fire with petrol, except the mischief makers. Good people run to a fire with water or the fire extinguisher. We are called to run to a fire with petrol. And if someone who is different to you comes along, don't laugh at them. Don't mock them. It may be that they may be different than you and they may be better than what you are. And so this Quran, this glorious Quran revealed in this holy month of Ramadan does not only give us the instruction to be good, it tells us how to be good. وَآخِرُ الدَّعْوَانَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Sorry about that. Ibrahim Bay, normally you are Excellent. Today you were absolutely brilliant. May Almighty Allah guide you and give you good health, inshallah. Shukran so much. Highly appreciated. Jamaat, words that we can really ponder about were we murdered or did we commit suicide? The gist of a very, very beautiful talk here today. The first of the respondents is the head of a very important organization in our country, the United Ulama Council also a member, one of the founding members of the Cape Accord, gives me great pleasure to call upon Sheikh Ehsan Talib. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلوات الله وسلام عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم. Our dear and honoured respected ulama and scholars, our father figures, our mentors, our beloved fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, and our innocent children. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Satari, it would have been better to balance uh, this group here by having Sister Fatima come and uh, speak after Ambassador Ibrahim Rasul. And uh, I would have advised that it would have been a good balance. Shukran Ibrahim for making it very difficult to say anything. The development that have been taking place in our community, different developments that have been happening in our community, have been causes of great concern, but these issues are issues that have been coming on for time. And uh, these are not issues that are peculiar, unfortunately and regrettably, to our community here in the Cape. They are happening, seem, happening seeming, seemingly uh, in the Muslim communities across the world. It would appear that we certainly, as uh, Ambassador Ibrahim had said, we certainly do not take lesson from history. It seems that we would rather follow the adage that says that history must repeat itself. History repeating itself is in fact a, 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 a system and a design of Allah. Wa wa and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks in the Holy Quran about history abundantly. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala references that he has certain laws that govern human existence on this earth. And that those laws are in fact referred to in the Holy Quran as sunnatullah fil ard. And Allah ta'ala emphasizes and he says, وَلَن تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَحْوِيلًا وَلَن تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَبْدِيلًا You shall not find divergence from those laws and deviation in those laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, substitution of those laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not in the most minute of forms. 
Allah's laws will always apply, irrespective whether they're on communities of faith, whether they're in communities of non-faith communities, it does not matter. And so whatever we bring forth with our hands, uh, we will reap the consequences thereof. ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس That mischief and uh, transgression shall spread through the earth and through the oceans on the basis of what human beings have brought forth with their own hands. So these laws of Allah, this, the, the natural laws of Allah, are many. And obviously they are in and around. We live them and we sometimes don't even realize that we live them. Of these laws are that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created human beings and the law that applies to them is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had decided against Allah ta'ala had decided against uniformity in this creation uniformity is not how allah created human beings walaw sha'a rabbuka laj'ala an-nas ummatan wahida had it been the will of allah he would create human beings as one ummah but his law is wala yazaluna mukhtalifin they shall indeed continue to have differences differ with one another, have different views, look at things differently, see the world differently. They shall do that forever. It won't cease. Differences is natural. That we would differ and have Sunnis and Shi'is is natural. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that you believe and that we believe as we are in this masjid uh, the majority of us are Sunni and that we have our beliefs is not just natural it is also our right because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also speaks about the freedom of conscience the freedom of thought the freedom of belief and all of that becomes part of Allah Ta'ala Sunnah on this earth. And so when we speak about the differences that we have with the Shia, you can't speak about it. There is no, no problem with that. The problem is, how do you speak about it? The problem is, how do you differ with one another? And so our brother sitting on the corner on that side, Brother Molana Aftab Haider, I've had opportunity to quote from himself saying, we do not have a problem if you critique, if you have, if you put forth your position of differences between the Sunnah and the Shia. That's not a problem. That's your right. But do not create mischief. Do not create and spread hatred. Do not incite the emotions of people and fan people's emotions to the point where people go into a stupor and into a frenzy of how they view the other person. I think the Cape Accord for us is about understanding that in our beautiful country in which we live, we also understand that we have the right to express our views, but we do not have the right to express those views whilst we incite hatred against anyone. If anybody, I think I've said it at this platform, if anybody spews hatred from this pulpit or from any pulpit, that person cannot be inspired by Ar-Rahman. On the contrary, that person will be inspired by Shaitan. Our beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had spoken about the emergence of the khawarij. He had foretold that there shall come among you people 
whom when you look at the way how they perform salah you will look at your own salah in disdain and say ya allah i should really brush up on my salah when you look at how they fast you will think about your own fast in real insignificant terms if you look at how they recite the quran you will think that you really need to be ashamed of how you butcher the quran but the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that they would have left the fold of islam like an arrow leaves its bow towards its target so notwithstanding the way in which the appearances are the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam had indicated that these people would have already left the fold of islam now these in our history were known as the khawarij these were people that for the most minute things would declare others kafir these were the very people who then ultimately were responsible for the assassination of sayyid ali radiyallahu ta'ala and so sayyid ali famously when the dispute between sayyid ali and sayyid muawiyah came to that point where the arbitration was put forth they then raised the slogan and said al hakimiyya lillah that the settlement of disputes shall not be done via arbitration but it must be done in accordance with the law of allah because law and judgment belongs only to allah with a sense of self righteousness with a sense of um a sense of arrogance and also a sense of clear extremist ideas of their own understanding of the deen of islam sin ali's famous retort to that was qawlun haqq yuradu biha batil qawlun haqq that is a true word that is being spoken but the intent behind it is batil and so when we then find that we are being incited towards hatred towards hating the other towards other rising and to looking at others in ways other than ways of dignity and respect as had been mentioned before then we need to become extremely extremely cautious and uh, uh, ask questions the reason why we believe the caper code is important again to the sunnah of allah is the entire sharia every hukum in the sharia is confirmed exclusively to secure the outcome of that hukum the hukum wants to secure an outcome or it wants in a positive way or it wants to avert a potential scenario in a negative way so therefore we believe we believe that sectarian speech sectarian hatred sectarian uh, discourse of inciting and encouraging others to look differently at others with hatred etc sectarianism is haram in islam allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the holy quran explains why that is the case and that is that you shall you shall self destruct you shall self destruct many places in the holy quran maybe just to quote the hadith of ibn mas'ud in the collection of imam al bukhari the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam says لا تختلفوا فإن من كان قبلكم اختلفوا فهلكوا don't fall into factionalism don't fall into disputes of rancor and hatred and factionalism among yourselves because those who have gone before you fell into such dis disputes and they perished and self-destructed may Allah Ta'ala accept this endeavor and initiative to be one which inshallah reaches the hearts of human beings and reaches in the depths of our hearts to bring out our humanity 
and so that our faith can be expressed on the platform of our humanity, inshallah. Shukran. MashaAllah, beautiful message of peace, tolerance, and harmony. Jamaat, our next speaker, a graduate of the Medina Institute, studied Maqasid al Sharia at Ipsa, holds an MBA, an MEC, as well as a PhD. I'm mentioning this because it's so proud that we have people of this caliber in our community. And Alhamdulillah, inshallah, she's progressing towards a PhD in nonviolence at the University of Toronto. Gives me immense pleasure to call upon Dr. Fatima Hendricks to the podium. Dr. Fatima Hendricks. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد النور وعليه Honorable Chair, Honorable Speakers, Honorable Respondents, Honorable Signatories, Honorable Sisters and Brothers and Honorable Youth Thank you so much to the esteemed speakers and respondents for your sterling contributions to your, this engagement on the Cape Accord. We have five minutes of response, and I'd like to propose that we spend three minutes of the time thinking about our challenges, and then the remaining two minutes suggesting a way forward. From the Center of Nonviolence and Peace Studies, which is an initiative of the Medina Institute, you know, perhaps it's most apt for us to really press the pause button. To maybe seriously interrogate ourselves with a few questions. We have been saying a lot of things. We've been saying Islam is a religion of peace. We've been saying Islam is a religion of love. We say we love each other for the sake of Allah. We say that we follow this, the sunnah, the esteemed prophetic example. We say we emulate his sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's adab the code of Muslim behavior bound up in honor, in kindness, in humaneness, civility, generosity, courtesy, and we say we are one ummah. Yet, my sisters and brothers, how much congruency is there between what we say and what we do? Allah the Sublime proclaims in Surah As-Saf, Chapter 61, verse 2 and 3, which in English may mean, O oh, believers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to you and I. Why do you say the things which you do not do? It is most hateful in the sight of Allah that you say things which you do not do. Unless we humanize this story, making it deeply personal, and descriptive of our human condition, meaning a story about you, about me, about us, and our contributions and complicity to everyday intellectual coercion and threats, our contribution to intellectual terrorism, our contribution to hate speech, we will fail. And dismally so. Self-critique is tough, but it's what we need to do. We are engaging in hate speech. Hate speech by an individual or group is speech that denigrates people on the basis of their membership to a particular group, the other. So let's ask this question. If we are one ummah, then who is the other? We cannot belong to the group unless they, other people, don't belong to our group. So who then are these others in this supposed one ummah united in our love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's unfortunate. We are hurting the very us we speak about in the ummah we claim to love. And to think that hate speech is innocuous, let's consider this for a second. How we go from what our respondents have spoke about, from waswasa to feelings that are, that are conjured up in our inner beings, that then manifests in actions 
that then results in murder and death. And we are complicit. We all know those, the, the rhymes. We've been growing up with these nursery rhymes, things like sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. However, our tradition begs to differ. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will surely harm me. We know from our religious tradition that Abdullah bin Amr bin al-As reported, and may Allah be pleased with him, that the Prophet Muhammad wasallam has said, a Muslim is the one from whose tongue and hands the Muslims are safe, and a muhajir is the one who refrains from what Allah has forbidden. And the ahadith are many. Most of our sins, the sins of the children of Adam, is because of our tongues. So let's be unambiguous. Let's be clear. Hate speech hurts more than just human dignity and integrity. Hate speech kills. Hate speech and defamation, we think they're these individual actions when we use words targeting and demeaning race. We demean gender, ethnic origin, religion, sexual preference. They are not private matters, my sisters and brothers. They are performed in public with a public orientation aimed at undermining the public good. And hate, my sisters and brothers, is an incredibly overwhelming concept. And it is leading to larger scale to societal toxicity in these speeches and in these words that we engage so innocuously about. We see this in, as we witness the violence, these deadly spasms of physical violence that have broken out because of religious sectarianism, xenophobia, racism, ethnic clash clashes, misogyny, and homophobia. And hate speech ranges from microaggressions to macroaggressions. It is offensive. And it insults. And it threatens and it disrespects, and it incites hatred. And it comes in so many different forms, varying shades of content, from abusive speech against the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, against the wives of Prophet Muhammad wasallam, in, uh, against the companions, peace be upon them all, to Islamophobic content, to gender dis denigration, it varies in context from our mosque boards to our families to our educational institutions. It varies in forms with that very quick WhatsApp, that those pamphlets that we see appear from nowhere, the tweets, the newspapers, the pamphlets, etc. And we have promoters of hate speech in every single corner of the country from the smallest little town to the biggest cities across the world with resulted impacts that are devastating. And how do we know that hate speech kills? Think about the Tutsi. Think about Rwanda and the genocide. Think about how a radio station allowed people to speak and encouraged things like hateful speech, the enemy being the Tutsi. If the radio had not declared that, this would not have happened is some of the research uh, comments. So, my dear sisters and brothers, in conclusion, it is Ramadan, alhamdulillah. It's time to, for us to take stock and to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness in pursuit of Qalbun Salim. As the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was sent to all mankind, all of humankind, until the end of time, we share this prophetic hub, hope, this prophetic love that connects each one of us. That same love that connects us with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's the sort of spiritual nationality that we have shared that really transcends ge geography and time bounds. And in Ramadan, we call on Allah by many of his names. By Ya Ghafoor, by Ya Ghafar. But as a community, may I request that we consider using Ya Jami' Al Jami'. 
the one who combines similar things, dissimilar things, and opposites. Apart from the obvious call to heal and unite our fractured ummah, the call and the use of this name is really a call to unite what is inside of ourselves, critically as a foundational building block, so that we are able to unite in congruence the co and coherently integrate our external behaviors, what we say, what we do, with the inner realities of the heart, with the values then and aspirations of Al-Furqan, what is found in the kalam, uh, in the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that each of us, this Ramadan, can say, we do as we say, we do as we say we believe, and hopefully we have more movement towards inner peace, a peace accord in our hearts, ending with the question, Fa'ina tadhabun, where, where are we headed? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names may certainly kill me. Rabbana atina min ladunka rahmata wa hayyit lana min amrina rashada. Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. MashaAllah, Sister Fatima, not only were you absolutely brilliant, but it was a riveting talk. I don't know whether you uh, love cricket, but you really bowled us over. Alhamdulillah. We really found your talk to be absolutely well-researched, well-presented, and I can speak on behalf of everyone here, mighty proud of you. May that PhD come sooner than later, inshallah, and may you continue to make a wonderful contribution, not only to the community of Cape Town, but all over, inshallah. Our second last speaker, Jamaat, is somebody that's been very much a fatherly figure to many of us here today. By that, I even mean that this morning I got a call at uh, quarter to seven, um, just reminding me of a couple of things. We really appreciate him very much. The Imam of the Zinatul Masjid, uh, um, uh, Zinatul Islam Masjid in Mew Street, Cape Town, a landmark masjid in our uh, part of the world. My absolute pleasure to call upon my beloved Sheikh Muhammad Murad to say a few words as one of the respondents, Sheikh Muhammad Murad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri, wahlu al-aqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Yes, uh, a fatherly figure. <laughs> let, let us just pause there for a moment. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brother Sitar Parker. I have now listened to all the speakers, and it makes it very, very difficult for me to respond to everybody. But firstly, let us go to my, my honorable advocate, Hafiz Abu Bakr Muhammad, speaking to us about Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbin Nas. Very much introspective. Very much dealing with the heart matters here. Waswasi al khannas you have to look inside yourself. And this is what this accord is all about. It is about how you feel within yourself, from the heart. You know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam guided us beautifully by saying, La tabaghadu wa la tanajashu wa kunu ibad Allahi ikhwana. Do not show anger hatred towards one another. Do not plot and plan against one another, but be brothers. And when the sister spoke about the other, I, it was, I was just, it was coming to mind, Dr. Abdul Malik Rushuddin. Dr. Abdul Malik Rushuddin, in one of his speeches, he says, if you remove the BR from brother, then it means your other self. That is your other self you are talking about. You don't have the right to talk about your other self or to promote hatred against that, that other self. And that is the other we are talking about. But in the meantime, we are talking about the hearts here. We talk about The saving factor in this particular verse here, that you are on the brink of the hellfire, 
is fa'allafa bayna qulubikum. That that love and mahabba and compassion came into your hearts. It is that was the saving factor for humanity. Yet again, where does that come from? That comes from our Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could not bring that hearts together. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, لَوْ أَنْفَقْتَ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا مَا أَلَّفْتَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ أَلَّفَ بَيْنَهُمْ If you want to spend the treasures of the earth to bring their hearts together, you can't do it, but Allah can do it. And that is the key factor here. It is often said, اللِسَانُ دَلِيلُ الْقَلْبِ That what you speak is a sign of what is in your heart. And that is crucial. So before we say anything, think of what is in our heart. Don't just say it because somebody else said it. Speak from the heart. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us, إِذَا صَلَحَتْ صَلَحَتِ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّ If that heart is right, the body and everything that emanates from it will be right. And therefore it needs to come from within. If we look at the, 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 the current problems that we are sitting with globally and study it very carefully, we will see whether it is Iraq, whether it is Syria, it has been a Sunni Shia conflict that's been created to kill and to destroy the very basis of our deen and our brothers and sisters. And we are allowing those conflicts to enter into our domains right here. We cannot allow that. Our mosques are not being spared. Our institutions are not being spared. They are destroying the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based on a slightest of difference. Today your salah is not right if your beard is not long enough. Your salah is not right if your sobe is not, uh, not short enough. Why? We have, they have the right to, to differ with us. We have the right to differ with them. Like our brother Dr. Rashid Omar always would say, Adab al And that is the ethics of how we deal with those differences. Our ambassador spoke about Allamahu al-Bayan. Allamahu al-Bayan, the intellect of every single human being. Last night, in one of my speeches that I made in the masjid reflecting on the Quran, let us not be of those who will stand in front of our Creator one day, inshallah, the day of Qiyamah, and we will say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we have followed sadatina wa kubara'ana fa'adalluna sabila that we have followed our leaders, our honorable ones, and our elders in the community, and we followed them, and they misled us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to us, what is in the Quran? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَفَكَّرُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَذَكَّرُونَ أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ Did I not give you an intellect? Did I not allow you? Did I not give you karama? Like our... Honorable speaker would always say, it is the haqqul karama. And the haqqul karama comes through the intellect. Allah has made us, gave us a karam, that honor because of the intellect that Allah blessed us with. And we need to be able to think for ourselves. So therefore it is important. Don't stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one day and say, Allah, but they said we must not sign the accord. They said we don't have to come to the accord. No, no, no. That is a whole lot of nonsense. We've got the Quran, we've got the Sunnah. Why do we need an accord? I'll tell you why we need an accord. Because the moment you commit yourself to this accord, it shows that you are pure within yourself, that you are committing yourself to something, that you are thinking about the future, inshallah. The footprint that we're going to leave behind for our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, inshallah, that they do not see what we are seeing today. And inshallah, that we carve out, we map out for them the road to paradise and the road to eternal riches, the road to eternal bliss for them, insha'Allah. That is the importance of embracing the accord and the importance of taking it to heart and spreading it to others, insha'Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rid us from hate speech, from violence, because ultimately that hate speech leads to violence. If I ask myself this question, why would somebody make me kafir? And then I would say, because he wants to make my blood halal. He wants, some, he wants to make every single maqsad of the sharia, every single 
benefit that the Sharia came with, the principle the Sharia came to protect, and that is my mind, my honor, my dignity, my wealth. If you say I'm a kafir, then you're making that halal. That means I can take it away from you. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you're a human being and you need to be protected under my law. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that protection, inshallah. We are in the month of Ramadan. If we take every single act of worship, call it act of worship, obligatory, salah, zakah, fasting, hajj, it regulates our character. Every single act of worship. You are so many hajjaj. We've been on Arafat, but what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk about hajj? al hajj wa ashur ma'lumat. Faman farada fiyyna al hajj what is it? Fala rafatha, wala fusuqa, wala jidala fil hajj. A training session you go through. There is no wrangling, there is no arguments, there is no fusuq, there is no mischief while you are in ihram because you're training yourself. What does Allah say about Ramadan? Man lam yada' qawla zur wal amala bih, fa laysa lillahi hajatun fi ayyada ata'ama wa sharaba. If you do not leave vain talk, unnecessary talk and you don't govern yourself you do not show anger you do not fight you do not wrangle while you are in fasting you are training yourself against hate speech you're training yourself against violence you're training yourself to be part of the accord may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us protect us inshallah and through what we are doing in this month inshallah transform ourselves to better human beings do not be self-righteous and say, فَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنِ اتَّقَى Don't declare yourself that you are the self-righteous and I am the pure one and I am the right one and I am the one that is... No, my dear brothers and sisters, only Allah knows who has the taqwa. إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ جزاكم الله خيرا for affording me the opportunity. Thank you very much to everybody for listening. وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَبَرَكَاتُهُ MashaAllah. Operative word, transformation. MashaAllah. Sheikh Muhammad Mirad, shukran so much. Jamaat, our final respondent today is uh, the Imam of the Claremont Main Road Masjid, Dr. Imam Rashid Umar, a, uh, a person, again, who does a lot of research before he will deliver a talk, and I'm sure today's response is going to be one of those very, very important ones. Imam Saab, the mic is yours. Thank you so much for being here. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي ونسلم على رسول الكريم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته فقد قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد في سورة المائدة وتعاونوا على البر والتقوى ولا تعاونوا على الإثم والعدوان صدق الله العلي العظيم الله the Lord of wisdom رب الحكمة proclaims in the glorious Quran in Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, ayah verse number 2, cooperate with each other in the promotion of righteousness and piety. At the Claremont Main Road Masjid, we have, for the past five years, been sounding an alarm about the growing threat of sectarianism creeping into our local Muslim community. During the past few years, the South African Human Rights Commission have been receiving a litany of complaints of discrimination and hate speech directed at individual Muslims, either because they profess to be Shiites or because they refuse to declare Shiites as Kafirs and outside of the fold of Islam. And therefore they are construed to be so-called Shia sympathizers. I suppose many of us who spoke today would come under that category. In one case, the funeral prayer, the Salatul Janaza, of a foreign national who was brutally murdered when his Janaza came to a masjid, it was refused entry because he was a Shia. In another case, which is currently being adjudicated in the South African courts, 
a prominent radio mufti, not only declared all Shias as kafirs, but also those who refuse to declare Shias as kafirs, as fasiqs. Now, much of this hate speech and vitriol is not by accident, it is actually deliberately fomented. And a lot of it happens on the social media forums. A group calling themselves the ADL, that sounds like the Jewish Defense League. Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'at Defense League. ADL Shia Awareness South Africa. This group acts as a front for those who do not wish their hands to be solid because you don't know who they are. They are Abu this and Abu that. I can be, my eldest son is Jihad. I can also be Abu Jihad and you won't know who I am. You can check it yourself. I'm not making this up. By those who do not want their own hands to be sullied, and they are sanctioning and giving legitimacy to this through their silence and their non-condemnation. During December 2017, just a few months ago, with the reopening of the Ahlul Bayt Center in Ottery, this anti-Shia sectarianism and hate speech reached a peak with a warning being issued for people to stay away from this opening ceremony. And some prominent Muslim leaders who had the courage, not like myself, who weak need, they had the courage to go there and attend the opening. They were severely chastised. This is the toxic environment and dangerous hate speech and discourse that started permeating and infiltrating the local Muslim community late in 2017. And very few people were willing to speak out against it, fearing that they will be labeled as Shia sympathizers. Now it is against this disconcerting background, and it is within this context that the Cape Accord was given birth to and was conceived in December 2017 by a few courageous organizations and leaders. The Cape Accord was a welcome intervention and therefore something that we at the Claremont Main Road Masjid fully embraced and continue to embrace. Now, in Ramadan 2018, after the horrific attack on the Imam Husseini Masjid in Durban on Thursday the 10th of May 2018, where the assailants slit the throat of one person, stabbed another to death, and set the Masjid library on fire, it has become even more critical to embrace the anti-sectarian message of the Cape Accord. Much more, however, needs to be done to educate and to popularize it amongst local communities. And more ulama organizations must be encouraged to sign it, and copies must be posted at all masajid in the front, locally and nationally. Ordinary Muslims, like ourselves, need to familiarize ourselves with the content of the Cape Accord and the direction it offers towards greater tolerance, good neighborliness, and love and brotherhood and sisterhood amongst different Muslim groups. In conclusion, in the aftermath of the Imam Hussein Masjid attack in Durban, there were malicious rumors that the attacks had been orchestrated by Egyptians, and later they became Iranians. We must therefore not be naive to the possibilities of Ajan provocateurs 
of outside forces intent on sowing discord among Muslims by exploiting the vulnerabilities of people's sectarian views. The source of these rumors should therefore form part of the investigation to apprehend the perpetrators and bring them to justice. We also note with concern that it has been three weeks now and the perpetrators of the attack on the Imam Husseini Masjid in Durban, they are still at large. So we once again call on the South African police services and the Hawks to intensify the investigations and to apprehend the perpetrators and to bring them to justice. May Allah protect us all from the scheming of conspirators, from the self-righteousness of extremists, and may he guide all of us to the best means and instruments to put an end to sectarianism in South Africa. And we believe that the Cape Accord is one modest instrument in that direction. Shukran for your patience with me. Takbir, takbir. MashaAllah, Dr. Rashid Umar, you've really rounded off the proceedings of today very, very beautifully. May Almighty Allah bless you and continue to give you the good health to lead your beautiful Jamaat in Claymont and all over as well. That brings us to the end of this session here today. Tandile Kona will be leaving. He's going to catch a flight, so he'll be escorted out. But I'd like to just make a very, very passionate appeal to every father, every mother, every wife, every husband, every daughter, every brother, every son. Please embrace the core values of the Cape Accord. Let us be the shining example like this wonderful community of the Cape has been. Let us continue to be a shining example, not only to the people of Cape Town, nationally and internationally, that we can live in harmony as human beings. With that, I call upon our Imam, Sheikh Abdul Rahman Alexander, to offer the closing dua here today, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil mursaleen, Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. Allahumma aftah lana bil khair, wa akhtim lana bil khair, wa ja'al awaqib umurina bil khair, biyadika al khair wa al-afiyah, innaka ala kulli shayin qadir. Bibarakati inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-Nabi, يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وأصحابه بارك وسلم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لا في خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر صدق الله مولانا العظيم. شكرا to all our participants on the program. There is a register as you leave. Can you kindly sign the register endorsing your support for the Cape Accord? Kindly sign the register and thank you so much to each and every one of you for attending as well as all the participants. All the Cape Accord people, can you please uh, um, remain behind for a photo call for a photo shot, please?